thank you, Nicole. I, I really appreciate that. That was nice. Um, really, though, the most important thing probably to know about me um, is that I'm Sarah Drake. I'm from Dwight, Illinois, and I love teaching history, and that'll about do it. <laughs> um, I, I really appreciate having the opportunity to speak with um, people in Muncie who are so actively involved in their community and who take the time to come out to discuss issues that are so vital for the constant development, improvement, and um, always looking to better our democracy. Um, we, well, I was talking with my students the other day in class, and we were discussing um, how to differentiate instruction. So how to have students read a primary source or a, a source that was written or created in the time period that you're studying, and how to make it more accessible to students. We were discussing whether or not we should change the words in the source, provide a word bank, et cetera and how to perhaps uh, write the source at different levels so that some of our strongest readers can engage with the document and people who are really struggling can still engage with the document. And I kind of made an offhand comment about how I've, I've noticed as of late, at the middle school level at least, that we do not have honors classes in history or civic education. We have people taking honors algebra in eighth grade so that they can get ahead in high school. And we have people taking honors English and honors science. But in history and the social studies, everybody is just together. And I used to be, I think, rather immaturely angered by that. And I was mad. I wanted us to have honors classes in history at the middle school level and for civic education. And then I thought, <laughs> Well, duh. What, what is this? Do we have high ability democracy? No. We have a democracy where everybody has to get together, be able to talk to each other, no matter if we have the most advanced degree, if we have no degree, if we have no degree but we are actually the smartest person in the room, it doesn't matter. We all have to be able to communicate. And so tonight, what I hope we can do is just simply practice communicating. A lot of times, um, what teachers are reluctant to do in schools, but uh, what is very necessary is to talk about controversial political issues. And um, a lot of times, teachers don't want to do this because they don't want trouble from parents. <laughs> they don't want trouble from the school board or other parts of the community. But a lot of researchers in civic education and I maintain that if we don't use the space in our schools to talk about difficult issues, how will we ever learn to speak about them in a respectful, deliberate, and purposeful manner as citizens? So let's get down to it. Um, to start us off, what I would like you to do is to consider the question that you see on the wall over there, should dreamers be guaranteed a path to citizenship? This is currently probably a hot topic. We might consider it. And so I would like for you not to talk about it yet, not to share your ideas with a neighbor, but just to think about your current position, your current perspective. And so on a scale of 1 to 10, we're going to kind of take the temperature of the room. A 1 is absolutely not. A 10 is absolutely 100%. What number do you place your set at, yourself on on that continuum to answer the question, should dreamers be guaranteed a path to citizenship? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass out a little sticky note, and they're all the same color. Nobody's going to know what number you're writing down. You can fold it and give it back to me so nobody's going to see it. But we are going to put it up there just to see where we are as a group uh, in respect to this idea. First of all, when we look over here, what my, my husband would love this. My husband is um, he, he, he's an engineer and a scientist, and all he wants to do is analyze data all day. So he would just be like, OK, what are we going to do? Wait, this is too easy. But um, what do we see over here? It's lopsided. There's not a lot of spread here. OK, so there seems we might think um, at the beginning to start us off at least with what people are willing to reveal at this point in time in this context 
that there is some sort of general consensus in response to this question. Now, let's look at the question itself, though, and what impact the wording of that question might have on how you responded. So, who wants to start us off here? What do you see about the way that question is phrased? Go ahead, yeah. The word guaranteed. Mm -hmm. So, so you've actually hit on two things there, guaranteed and then pack. And what does that look like? So I don't even know if you knew you did that. And <laughs> you were talking, but, no, but guaranteed you, is the word that caught Yeah, so guaranteed was definitely the thing. And then, and then she also picked up on pack. What other thing? I think well, actually, the word pack is the mm -hmm. one uh, that gives that guaranteed the citizenship, I hope, is significant. Okay. But this was. The, the specific definition of what is meant by a dreamer also has an impact on how perhaps people are responding to this question. Any other ideas or thoughts that you had? Well, just the fact that using the term dreamer instead mm. of dreamer is important. It's important. It is, and, and it's, it's referring to a specific mm -hmm. subset. Um, in a specific way. In, in a specific context that people are whether or not you're actively participating in the conversation, I would maintain that the fact that you're here and you're inundated with social media and these ideas every day, you're taking positions in ways that you interact with different people. All right, so we have, this is just kind of a general starting point and we're noticing that always when questions are asked, the way that they're phrased and the words that are used are really important. Now, when we talk about this concept of immigration, in general, um, we usually kind of center on the idea of a nation and nationhood. And that's also a word that needs to be, I think, explored and discussed. So what I would like for you guys to do is, let's, do you mind moving around a little? Can I do that? Okay. Um, how about in about groups of three <laughs> and maybe with people who you're not all that familiar with so you can meet some new people? Let's, well, you probably all know each other, and I'm the person who doesn't, but whatever. Um, <laughs> we can humor me. Um, let's talk about these two questions. What is a nation, and how does a nation get its identity? All right, so if you wouldn't mind just shifting around a little so you can be in approximately groups of three. What is a nation, and how does a nation get its identity? Yeah. So how about in about mm, three or four minutes, you're each ready to talk about your ideas. So make sure that someone is willing to stand up and, I don't know, be Vanna White or something like that and hold your thing. And make sure that someone in your group is also willing to speak to represent the group. All right, so make sure that you rock, paper, scissors or do something to pick someone. <laughs> you guys, how about if we take an opportunity to listen to each other and see what we've been talking about here. So what let's do to start us off is let's go back to our two big questions that uh, we began with. And they're over there if you need a refresher. What is a nation and how does a nation get its identity? Now, one of the things that we want to avoid is um, having the first group tell everything and then nobody else has anything left to say except for what they said. And so if you could start us off, we'll have you guys start us off, but how about if you just pick like your thing that you like the best 
and just talk about one way that you answer what is a nation and how does a nation get its identity. And then we'll hear from other groups and then we can come back if people want to add more to the conversation. How does that sound? All right? Okay, so kick it off for us, please. The, the big question first that everybody had, what is a nation and how does a nation get its identity? Um, you said that a nation is like people that share a culture, and so what makes your culture is the different values, ethnicity, history, geography, and tradition that tie together different groups within the nation. Okay, so you're really placing it under this kind of big umbrella of culture and then defining culture in a specific way. And they like agree to be governed by a set of rules that defines like, the nation. OK, so there's some sort of like almost common bargain agreement that is struck that we're going to live under these ideas, it sounds like, is what you're saying. How about you guys back there? Well, I, I didn't get to share <laughs> I just grew up in a nation that had so many different fighting cultures that I didn't sort of think of it that way. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that is the assumption, isn't it? So that, yeah, so I put that at the top. So you were looking more at just actual political lines and boundaries and geographic features yeah. as, as, the, uh, as one of the key defining For me, that's choices. it, because you know, I grew up in Africa, so they just stick these boundaries around different nations, essentially. To Poof, me, it's a nation. The nation of there it is. Okay. So, so that confused me, but I do. Th I, I that is the assumption or the connotation of the word. I do think nation and shared culture is what most people assume. I, I would agree with that. Okay. All right. How about you guys? Well, we talked about how like Germany, Italy, didn't mm -hmm. have states, but considered themselves nations in the 19th century. But mm -hmm. then I think Ed really summarized it for us. We went American, and, and Ed said that it should be. So why do you say not anymore? But I'd like to return to that that idea though, because it used to be, as you say, mom, apple pie, and baseball with this idea of America. And so why did you say you don't think that exists anymore?
So this idea of values is something that I didn't, I'm not sure I heard anybody say. Did you talk about it at all yeah. in your groups? Yeah. You guys did? You guys did? Or no? Shared values. Sh shared values. Okay, Which maybe people said it. I'm not a idea though of the idea of shared values mm -hmm. is that more important than a reality of shared values or so where do we have this tension between ideas and how things are played out mm -hmm. on the ground So we do have these kind of core principles, rule of law, constitutionalism. We can identify core documents that seem to represent values that we all some, in some way at least think we share. But then when we get into actually interpreting them and actually talking to the people who live and work around us every day, we kind of find that it's maybe not what we think it is. And so some of the ways that we can maybe look at this is to consider the, what, what um, sometimes called the social glue that holds a society together. And three of the, the groups got to discuss the social glue that is holding groups of people together at different levels, at the national level, at the state level, and at the community level. So you guys had the community level, right? So let's kind of start with Muncie. Here we are. So, what social glue do you think holds Muncie together? And then um, you were also asked to consider, does every member of this community maybe agree with what you're identifying as the social glue that's holding the community together? Yeah, it was interesting because we have some, you know, we have people who come in from outside and people who have been born here. And she could identify social glues that I didn't raise kids here. So the schools, the sports, apparently that crosses all the boundaries in Muncie, the north side and south side. If, if the kids grow up, they have this shared link through that public system and recreational system, which I wouldn't know anything about, right? I don't know what the social groups are. But it did seem like when we were talking about where does everybody get together, yeah, there's a lot of disagreement about what social blue is depending on the subculture. You're here. Mm -hmm. But you know, it just occurred to me, isn't like just street driving rules, things like that, it's social, like we all go out together expecting people in Muncie to like to follow, you know, there's like these broader rules that glue us together and let us get along, but this confuses me, the glue part. <laughs> it's, it's kind of hard to, it's kind of hard to define yeah. because um, it maybe depends on so tell me what you think about this. You know, what, what circles do you run in? Mm -hmm. Like, is that your glue that's holding you together? But if you're not part of an organization that is fundamental to someone else, then that's not necessarily something that you consider mm -hmm. as being vitally important to the health of your community. Is, is there anything else that, that you guys wanted to add? Well, we really uh, couldn't come up with anything that we felt the north and the south side of Muncie would all agree. We were trying to think of a geographical location that 
would attract people from all over the um, city, and there and we couldn't think of one. There's such a, 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 a division, um, and so we thought there was little agreement. There would be, except maybe with the schools. I mm -hmm, mean, mm -hmm. because everybody wants their child to be well educated and um, and sports. That was pretty much <laughs> where we thought the community could come together. And I'd love to be proven wrong, but there are other places that. Well, if nothing else, we can identify that, and it's a good starting point, right? I mean, I am purposely, perpetually, naively optimistic. <laughs> While being a hard, cold realist, I always do think that we, we can do better and we can solve the problems. And so that seems to me like we've identified, if nothing else, a really good starting point. How about you guys at the state level, right? Okay, yeah, well, we have quite a long list of things we thought identified. Um, I, I said that once upon a time, I would have said basketball was sort of an identifying characteristic of the Hoosier identity, but it seems to have been supplanted by the Colts. <laughs> Sad, so that is. I, I had my. I had my children, I have a sixth grader and a third grader, and two weeks ago we watched Hoosiers, because they had not yet seen it. And I was like, we're watching this movie. Oh, that's so they loved it, so we're keeping that's basketball right. alive. Okay. That's you. right, that's right. <laughs> the way the Colts are going, we have to go back to basketball. <laughs> that at the state level here, you're identifying things. It seems like you had an easier time than at the community level, but you noticed yourself that some of these things might be a little bit mythological. Yeah. Um, how about when we turn to the national level? What did you see there? <laughs> The individualism, yeah, the balance yeah. between liberty and order, like the, the rights of the individual, the protection of the common good, these ideas, um, I mean, they're hard. Yeah. <laughs> this is the thing. We, we have some of the, I'll, I'll say this, I think it totally, we, we have like the best political philosophy that's been created and living up to it is the challenge. I mean, that's, that's the thing that we have to try, try to do. Did you want to add something? Well, I, I was stuck with a paradox in the sense that thinking about this nation and what they were founded on and dragging on some sense of individualism, at the same time, I'm pretty bothered by the gnawing disease of 
states' rights, even mm. though we have this national rule of law that really holds us together, but if you let Maine and Alabama have their own way, it's not going to be the same country. Uh, it, it's I live near Canada, and I live in Quebec, and there's always a problem. Mm. Uh, and, and I think our states' rights have really driven us crazy to, I mean, even from dumb things like different speed limits in different states, and abortion laws, and health education, and you know, so this individualism. So am I. And so the, the power of the language to shape our identity and culture, which maybe could change over time. And that's what you guys were addressing is the question of how do national identities perhaps change over time and to what extent do nations have a permanent culture? And so how did you guys respond? I think we're very much on the same page that we think they have to change over time and they have to adapt given the circumstances and problems that arise and change over time. Uh, too often, you know, I don't I don't think 
think it's always going to work that way. Mm -hmm. I think it's mm -hmm. going to fail a lot of the times, so hopefully not, not most of the time. But <coughs> I think it's President Obama in his last speech mentioned the Enlightenment. And maybe it's tragic that many people in the United States don't know that word anymore. But to a large extent, that's where I see this country coming from. And, uh, and that's the beauty of it. When we talk about how we bring together these ideas about ideal principles and laws, and we consider this concept of immigration in that context, we just add lots of layers onto the complexity of the discussion. Um, I think we could go on for like hours with this. We have one more thing we're going to add. Yeah. Mm. talk about moral dilemmas, this always gets complicated. And in our public schools, it gets a little dicey when we ask teachers to try to talk about these ideas. If we return to what we were doing at the very beginning, I almost said class, um, of this session, um, when we were looking at that question that you just brought us back to, should dreamers be guaranteed a path to citizenship? And I ask you to put yourself on the continuum. We noted right away that we had some pretty obvious grouping that took place when we put our post-it notes up there. I I'm wondering the extent to which you would have felt comfortable having this conversation or any conversation if there would have been a substantive amount of ones when they had been put up there. And it would have been actually more of a spread than kind of a definite tilt toward one end. That's one thing to, to maybe think about um, as adults and as people who are wanting to come on a Thursday evening <laughs> to participate in a session like this. That, that probably wouldn't have bothered you all that much, maybe. But in a classroom, when you are 12 years old or 17 years old, that has a pretty significant impact. It also has an impact on how your teacher sets up a discussion. Um, before we, I have to go fiddle with the, the projector for a second. So as a good teacher, while I do that, I'm going to give you a question to consider. Um, what I would like you to think about is if you, when you were a student, or if you have children who are part of uh, K-12 or even K-16 who are in university, um, to what extent are you comfortable with the instructor disclosing his or her position on a controversial political issue when you're leading a discussion in the class. So in other words, if I had started off this discussion with that question by saying, here's where I am and slapping my thing up there, um, what do you think about what might be useful with that? Because there is research that suggests that is very useful. And what might be detrimental, because there's also research that suggests that that is, is detrimental. So talk amongst yourselves for a second while I go <laughs> fiddle with the technology. <laughs> you guys respond to this question? What are, what are some um, advantages or disadvantages with a teacher just closing his or her position? We can start with wherever you guys want. Oh, yeah, we had a good disagreement here because I, of course, say just be frank and truthful and take advantage of your authority to influence people. That's my position because I think I'm right, you know, so as a teacher. But, um, to it on their own, don't influence them, don't, because people are fear, fearful to think and, you know, they tend to take the road, just go with the authority, or they're afraid to express their opinion if someone comes out and says the right answer. So mm -hmm. um, I think we would need data to know, and probably it would depend where you are. I mean, on the East Coast, there's a lot more training in how to disagree comfortably than when you come to the Midwest, and there's a lot more. and hold the discussion. Like, it's a different cultural style here. 
So I, it may be different depending on where you are. And see, that's funny because as a native of the Midwest, yeah. I think that people just go, huh. Yes. And just like, you can keep talking. I'm smiling. I'm not listening anymore. You know, you know what I mean? That's just, like to me, that's, I think that's my like cultural code that I learned somehow as a, as a little girl. Huh. It would be nice. <laughs> that is a different thing. So, so you started off, Carol, with saying that you absolutely think that a teacher should disclose. This is what I mm -hmm. have done as a teacher. Sure. And, and because I, I think if you have it, typically what happens in my experience is you almost always have at least one student that is comfortable taking an opposing position. Mm -hmm. And then as the teacher, you can show the class how that's okay and leave. Mm -hmm. a broader discussion. So mm -hmm. if you don't sort of get out there first and find, you know, I mean, that can not always work. It can be hard with the wrong group, but usually you can show people how to have a, a discussion mm -hmm. as the teacher. So so that's do other people agree with that position? Here's Carol. Yes. So what have you talked about? Well, I, I, I'm K through 12. I, I taught well, elementary well, and at art. So. You is, I don't know this. Constantly, you do. You have to read and respect the room and back off. I mean, there's some sensitivity that would be involved. But in general, I would err on that side. I would like someone else's opinion or data if that is a bad. They're a little worried about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. No, okay. Well, she says she's noticed the difference because she's lived all over the world, born in Muncie and been to different countries. And to her, it's quite noticeable that disagreement is it's handled differently in different cultures. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. even in the classrooms of the college kids, it seems a lot harder to draw up discussion. They're, they're, they're just very worried. I'm not sure the process of getting people there. Well, it's interesting because at the same time that it's really difficult, um, <laughs> it's not actually surprising at all, it's difficult when you're together sitting in a room to draw up discussion about disagreement, but people sure will pop off on Twitter and just say yeah. the worst, ugliest things to each yeah. other and just shouting into the void and not care at all because they don't have to live with the repercussions of facing the person that they were just so incredibly rude to. Yeah, so you also, mm -hmm. it also it, we're entrenched. Mm -hmm. We become entrenched in our side. So, you know, the, the point of disagreement in person is to potentially kind of whittle away at some of that, what those trenches mm -hmm. to come to a new understanding. Mm -hmm. But we don't live there anymore. We live in, I'm entrenched here, and I'm going to yell at you on social media. You're entrenched there. You're going to yell back at me. But I can walk away from it. I don't have to grow or learn or take another view in that kind of environment. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And we've become very uncomfortable with that discussion piece. Mm -hmm. Because we, everything's like it says, like or dislike. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. there's, there's no There's no nuance. There's no right. negotiation. There's, people don't want to have to admit that they got it wrong. I, I mean, I see this all the time on something as trite as ESPN, right? People will say, well, this is how this season is going to go. And I mean, roll tape. You said it three months ago that this team was going to win, and they are scraping the cellar, right? And this person won't admit that he or she got it totally wrong and is now all in the love of this team that's playing really well. And, and no one wants to... Like even just say, oops, you know, messed that one up. Sorry, it's it's a game. Who cares? Nicole, you're gonna say something. Well, we, this is actually what we talk about. Like you're saying, part of the reason that students don't have honest discussions in the classroom is that they are afraid now of being labeled. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. Should you be over there in number right. one? Go ahead. Well, it's just that the, the, the teacher creates that culture. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so that's why it's, it's important oftentimes to not, I think, um, have students engage in debates in your class, but rather to engage in deliberation. And so to, 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 to foster deliberative discussions and deliberative democracy so that we are willing to talk about these ideas and not just say, this is my position, and I'm going to say every smart aleck thing I can to score points and be funny and win over people on my side. Instead, as teachers, we may very well say, guys, this is my position on this, as, as you were suggesting. Here is the evidence I have used um, to support the argument that I'm going to make. There are other ways to get to a similar argument. There are ways to take a completely different stance and use some of the same evidence, not to manipulate it or you know, make up things about it, but rather to say, I can use this evidence, interpret it in a different way, and get to a very different conclusion. One of the things that it's important for teachers to have, um, I'm not gonna walk you through like an entire curriculum or anything, but um, at Brown University, uh, there's a center that has put together what's called the Choices Curriculum. And so in the context, for example, of immigration and um, the debate in US policy, what they have are different ways for teachers to build 
conversations with students about these types of issues. By engaging students in the community and collecting oral histories pertaining to immigration, by providing them with a historical context, with um, different forms of data to analyze, to consider different immigrant experiences, to um, map the movement of people as different crises develop, and then to really increase and improve students' persuasive abilities through writing and through speaking. And then also uh, engaging in, in this particular example, identifying problems and solutions for resettlement um, in, in some specific cases. Um, one of the things that it's really important to focus on as we think about these ideas, especially with with respect to um, my particular area of interest, which is K-12 education, is um, making sure that our citizens can talk about ideas and are willing to engage so that they actually do vote and that we have voter turnout. Um, this interactive map, which I'm not going to take time to walk you through right now, shows, um, as, as is indicated, voter turnout in this case that I've highlighted for uh, voters ages 18 through 29. And um, it isn't all that great. <laughs> it's not, we know that voter turnout nationally is not all that great, but voter turnout for our students ages 18, 18 through 29, our citizens rather, is not all that great either. I will take a second to just highlight um, Indiana. You can see where we are. Uh, nationally there at 41.4 percent. So not the worst, but um, definitely not, not the best either. Um, you guys had such, were such enthusiastic discussers that I appreciate that. I wasn't able to get to one of the things that I wanted to show you, but instead what you can do is you can play this game on your own at home because it is a game. It is sweeping the nation. And I'm not even kidding. It's called iCivics. It was um, first put together and sponsored by Sandra Day O'Connor. And this is um, an interactive game that uh, teachers can use at the middle school, mostly middle school, sometimes for fun at the high school level. And um, you can just check it out on your own, on your devices. But if you play Do I Have a Right? You can focus on aspects of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. You can set up yourself as a lawyer who is um, opening a law firm, and then cases will be presented to you, and you can make decisions based on um, different aspects of the Bill of Rights. So if you hadn't been such good discussers, we were going to apply some of the things that you had learned in previous weeks in the context of this game. But I'll leave it to you to, to do that on your own. Do we, do we have time for any questions? Or? Anybody have questions? Or? Yeah. Do you mean just for um, 18 to 29 year olds? Do you mean overall? Didn't we, we got better like for a couple of elections that were yeah. kind of just hovering in the. Hovering around 50. Yeah, just, just kind of below a little bit. Like 40, 60. Yeah. So you would have been a one, right? Me a one? <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> well, I think you guys are, oh, do we, do we have any other things? I think we're discussed out, yes? So thank you so much. I appreciate it. <laughs>